Hi there, campers. Welcome back to Virtual Campfire Stories for Grown-Ups. This week, I have a little surprise for you. I'll be reading two stories, one average length, one very short. The short one was too short to do alone, but I thought it was funny, so I figured I'd add it in anyways. At this point, you probably already know how this works, so I won't go into too much detail. But if you are new here, a new story will be released each Monday morning until the end of summer reading. You can find new stories on our YouTube channel at 8 a.m. on Mondays and can listen to them in perpetuity after that. Listen on your commute, while you're doing dishes, weeding in the garden, or any other mundane task that needs a little spice. All that being said, I'm Librarian Lily, and I will once again be your narrator. Let's begin. Today's first story is Secret Elk Study Revealed by Kurt Buckholtz from the collection Campfire Stories, Tales from America's National Parks. Much to my surprise upon leaving park headquarters the other day, I walked to my car and discovered an envelope tucked beneath its windshield wipers. Scrawled upon it was the note, Elk Study. The parking lot was strangely deserted. A short distance away, in the meadow beyond, grazed a half-dozen bull elk. I sensed that they eyed me suspiciously while I tore open the envelope. We read about your nature association and your park service, the scribbling began. We read about how you caught 50 elk and put radio collars on them. We read about your plan to count them every year for five years. And we think you're up to no good. We think that after five years, you're just going to tell us that you have too many elk. Well, we've got news for you, buddy, the scribble continued. There aren't too many elk, Mr. Smarty Pants. There are too many people. Attached to that note was a 50-page, single-spaced report. By its heft alone, you could tell someone had compiled a ton of statistics and a pound or two of verbiage. Swiftly, I thumbed through this document, looking for some telltale sign of what it all meant. My eyes settled on a heading titled, Executive Summary. In 1990, it began, the elk study team darted, tranquilized, and collared 50 human beings. I could hardly believe my eyes. Amazed, I read on. Locations for the collaring included Horseshoe Park, Moraine Park, and the Estes Valley Golf Course. Dates of collaring ranged from September 1st through September 30th, 1990. The purpose of this study was to trace the movements and conduct a census of humans within Rocky Mountain National Park and the Estes Valley during a five-year period. Holy cats, I whispered aloud. How did they do that? Our analysis of human movement prior to the study revealed concentrations of human activity in the Horseshoe Park area during our previously rather private rutting season. This influx of humans has made them especially vulnerable to the stare and snare capture technique. The largest number, 28 or 56 percent, of individuals were trapped and collared in this location. Secondarily, Moraine Park offered significant concentrations along the Cub Lake Trail. Nocturnal trapping activity ranged from the east and southeast grid of Moraine Park campground. A total of 18, or 36 percent, of the captures occurred within this matrix. The fewest captures, 4, or 8 percent, occurred on the Estes Park golf course. While this human population was older than the average and was the primary target for capturing and collaring, the team discovered that this population was most susceptible to shock and sudden death. Three humans died during the initial phase of our collaring operation and before we realized their susceptibility to stress. Success of darting and collaring was largely due to the new generation of tranquilizers now commonly used by the human population. Many of the collared humans, in fact, were approached and successfully captured and collared while dozing. The five-year tracking study revealed the movements of these 50 humans and their associated herds. This study enabled us to determine whether their population was increasing or decreasing. It also allowed us to determine their patterns of movement and the extent of their range. Summary. After five years, two of the four humans, or 50%, captured on the Estes Valley Golf Course were found in the general area. Captured in 1990 near the 6th Green, in 1995, the two remaining were spotted together approaching the 17th tee. 
We cannot hypothesize about the two missing humans, except to say that our earlier experience with stress among these particular mammals does not bode well for their survival. At the Moraine Park location, after five years, only three, or 16.66%, of the original population remained. It is our suspicion that those three may not be among the typical mobile population of humans, but rather part of an indigenous species somehow related to park management. Interestingly, the three were spotted within a quarter mile of their original capture site. We cannot explain the loss of all other human subjects, and cannot attribute their loss to mortality. Instead, it is possible this Moraine Park site hosts a basically transient population. At Horseshoe Park, after five years, only one, or 3.57%, of our trapped and collared humans could be found. While this site was densely populated during the capture period, and even more so in 1995, we cannot empirically explain the lack of collared humans. It has been argued in previous studies, citation Malthus Ehrlich, that human populations rise and decline. Yet, the human population at Horseshoe Park, in particular, demonstrated increased general density in 1995 as compared to 1990, even though collared humans were absent. We speculate that the 1990 collared humans may have chosen less dense sites if they were visiting in 1995. Satellite tracking provided a range study for 31, or 62%, of the collared humans. We caution that subject individuals may not represent herd movements. But single individuals were tracked to Japan, numbers 16, 18, and 34, Australia, number 4, and Germany, numbers 6 and 24. A total of 6 ranged to Denver, 5 ranged to Fort Collins Greeley. Surprisingly, 14 ranged to a single city in Iowa, specifically Des Moines. Conclusions. Our population study reveals the density of humans increasing 28% between 1990 and 1995, or an average increase of 5.8% annually during the month of September. While the density of humans is increasing, the transient nature of the human population is also evident. Both individuals and, we surmise, herds are far more fickle regarding territoriality than our earlier studies demonstrated. Citation, Morris Gibbon. Within the five-year period, few humans remained in or returned to their original capture sites. Recommendation. Before any radical solution for the culling of the human population from the areas in question can be proposed, additional studies should be conducted. A dissenting minority of this study team, however, insists that immediate measures be taken to reduce the human population. As I finished reading... I looked over my shoulder to see six bull elk stepping closer, as if grazing and glancing at the same time. I jumped in my car and sped away. Thus concludes our first story today. The second story is The Legend of the Blue Mist by Bill Robinson from the collection Campfire Stories, Tales from America's National Parks. The best time to tell this story is on a cloudy, overcast evening because that's when these events happened. The whole story takes place in the Fall River Valley. I've never been able to check as to when Minor Bill, who is the principal character of our story, came into this country. Minor Bill probably followed the Platte River, looking for gold, and then caught the Thompson, finding a trace of gold there. From there, he branched out on Fall River and finally located a mile and a half above Chasm Falls, which later became Rocky Mountain National Park. He never acquired any deed to this land or anything, he just built a cabin there, dug a mine, and then settled in. He was a very strange man. I heard that he was the stepbrother to William Oppenheimer, who was connected with the Manhattan Project. Miner Bill knew enough to understand the tremendous power of what they were creating. That's why he decided to become a hermit up on Old Fall River Road. There was a lodge up there, the Fall River Lodge Inn built around 1908. About 1939, I came into the picture there at the lodge. A friend of mine managed the saddle horses at the lodge, and I came in to run it for him. This is where my first acquaintance with Minor Bill was. They, the National Park Service, had just opened Trail Ridge Road, so I assume it must have been about 33 or 34. Then, 
They closed Old Fall River Road down for a good number of years. That is where Miner Bill lived as a hermit. People here in town, Ron Brody for one, say that Miner Bill would come to town once a year. They would gather him in, make sure he had a bath, clean him up, provision him, and then send him back up there. As I say, in 1939, I became acquainted with Miner Bill because we had a lot of horseback trips up that way. He was very elusive, though. He would hide when you came in sight. But after so many trips up and down, he finally came out and made his presence known. He asked if we would pick up provisions for him in town and drop them off. He was very happy, and I'm sure he eked out enough gold from the hill up there to make a living. At least he never wanted for anything. When he sent us to town in those days, it was real strange to carry a little poke of gold dust. You'd have to go to the Estes Park Bank to Charles Hicks down there, and he would weigh it out and give Miner Bill credit in an account he kept down there. You'd buy provisions for him then, and take them back up to him. About, oh, 1941, they reopened the road, Fall River Road, and there was a lot of travel going up and down. Miner Bill would sit out there, and if people saw him, they would jump out and take his picture. Well, he thought this was a pretty lucrative thing, so he started charging to have his picture taken. If people didn't pay, say if somebody just stopped their car and took his picture, when they'd get up the road around the next switchback, he'd fire his old rusty gun at them and scare the heck out of them. Well, the park service didn't go for that, and they tried to evict him, but he claimed he had lived there so long that he had squatter's rights on that land, so there wasn't much they could do about him. Things were status quo for probably five or six years from 39 on. At that time, there was a young man in Denver, a radio announcer named Troy Torland, who was just breaking into radio. He was one of the first backpackers we ever saw up here. Back in those days, you could ride all day in the national park and not see another soul because the hiker and the backpacker hadn't really come into this area yet. Troy happened to be one of the first ones, and he loved to hike. He didn't care about horses, though. He would ask us to take his provisions on horseback to where he was going, but he'd say that he'd rather walk. So, he hiked in, and it was late one September that Troy came into the lodge. He'd always leave his car at the garage, and he'd say, I'll be back tomorrow, or I'll be back two days from now, so we knew when to start looking if he didn't show up. He was a real responsible young man, though. So, he left on this late September day, and shortly after, one of these early winter storms with the clouds came in. A lot of you have probably been up here when the clouds seemed to settle right in the whole valley and just cover everything. Well, this was one of those storms. Troy had gone up the old Ute Trail and cut down by Iceberg Lake down to Willow Park, and was coming out the Old Fall River Road when the clouds just really closed in. The only way he could find his way back down was by following the sound of the river. All of a sudden, Troy said he saw a light, and so he made his way to the light, which happened to be this old cabin that Miner Bill had built. This cabin, incidentally, had eight sides on it. Miner Bill had built it out of logs. It had a real pointed roof and a big flat rock on the roof. Whenever somebody asked Miner Bill what the rock was for, he'd say that it was to ward off the evil spirits. Really, it was to keep the wind from blowing the roof off in the winter. Troy went up and knocked on the door. Miner Bill came to the door, and Troy told him that the weather had closed him out. He was seeking shelter for a little bit until he could get his bearings. Well, I was about ready to eat, and I've got plenty for you, so why don't you come in and have dinner? So Troy went in and ate dinner, and they started talking, and found that they had a lot of mutual interests. Troy loved the outdoors, and Miner Bill did too. Troy knew enough about his past or people he had been with, so they talked until probably 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. Troy got in the next day and told us he had spent the night with Miner Bill, which seemed real unusual to us. He said, he's a nice old man and we have a lot of common interests. I'm going to come back every chance I get and go up and see him. He did this for about two years. Every free weekend he had, Troy went up and saw Miner Bill, and he'd spend the night with him. So knowing Troy, we got a little more acquainted with Miner Bill, and probably did a few more favors for him and whatnot. Well... World War II came along about that time. Troy went into the service. Shortly after, I went in. Two years later, I was back on furlough. Troy happened to be here at the same time on furlough, so he went up to see Miner Bill, and I rode the country. When Troy got back, he said, Something is happening up there. I don't know what it is, but Miner Bill is real nervous about whatever it is. 
So we left that summer and came back a year and a half later. I beat Troy back out, and the first thing I did was come up to the lodge. It was late fall, and so I rode a few of the trails. I looked the country over and happened to stop by to see Minor Bill. He was real elusive, and I thought, well, I've been away for a couple of years. He doesn't remember me and whatnot. But after talking to him, it didn't seem to bridge a gap in there, and I knew there was something wrong. It was the next spring before Troy came back, and he came in the lodge early that spring. He said, I've got to go up and see Minor Bill. So he went up and came back a couple of days later. He brought us a list of provisions that Minor Bill needed. He said, the first chance you get, you take these to him and check on him. I'll be back up. I'm not going back to my job right away. I'm going to come up and spend two or three weeks with him. I'll try to talk him into leaving the hills and going back to Denver with me. Well, the next day, I took the provisions up to Minor Bill, and there was a funny feeling about the whole area up there. I think Minor Bill probably tried to give us this impression, but there was something strange. So, about a week later, Troy came up and he said, I'm going in for a couple of weeks to hike and spend some time with Minor Bill. So we went up there. Probably a week later, I rode by and I didn't see anyone. I heard a dog barking, which was real strange because Minor Bill didn't keep pets around. He ran a little trap line because there were a lot of deer and elk up there. He had a few chickens out in the chicken house to furnish him eggs and meat, but that was about all. Well, I heard this dog barking, so I went over and tied my horse and looked in the cabin window. There was a big Doberman Pinscher dog chained up in the cabin. There was one post right in the middle of the cabin holding the roof up that this dog was chained to. I thought this was a little strange. There was no sign of either Troy or Bill, so I went back to the lodge. It was probably about four or five days later that Troy came back to the lodge. He said, Something is happening up at Minor Bill's in that particular area that I'm not familiar with. I can't get any information out of Minor Bill at all but something is developing there that only he is aware of. Troy said that he had two or three job interviews. He'd be gone for about a month, but would be back at the end of August. He wanted to go up there then and bring Minor Bill out. In the intervening time, we'd drive by there to check on him. Minor Bill would generally leave a little note on the door if he needed anything, provisions or whatnot, and the few letters he got. He got quite a few letters, actually, for being a hermit, and a lot of scientific journals and whatnot came in. We'd generally pick up his mail, which was delivered to the lodge, and anybody going by would just drop it off. He had credit at the bank to buy his provisions. Probably three times the next month, he left messages on the door for supplies of one sort or another, and we'd pick them up and deliver them. Troy came back that August and went up there and spent three days. He came back and said, I can't talk the old man into coming out. He's going to stay there. But something is wrong up there. I know it. I've got a job in New York and I'll be gone about three months, but I'll be back and we'll try it again. At that time, I was going to school down in Fort Collins, but I spent all my weekends up at the lodge. So it was late in December that I happened to be up there on the weekend. We had a kind of nasty weather situation that month and there was probably a foot and a half of snow on the ground up there. Troy pulled in late Friday evening and said, I'll spend the night with you all here. The first thing in the morning, I'm going up and I'm going to talk Minor Bill into coming out. He just can't survive another winter up there. So, Troy went up and the clouds really came in. We had probably four or five inches of fresh snow before the storm quit, but then the clouds settled back into the valley. Monday passed, and Tuesday passed, and the clouds hadn't lifted. Early on Wednesday morning, Troy came back down. He came in around breakfast time, which means that he'd had to have left there about midnight to have made his way down. Troy sat down and had breakfast with us. He never said a word. We all finished breakfast and started to make plans for the day, going this way and that way. Finally, he said, I've just got to talk to somebody, and we've got to do something with Minor Bill. We went through an experience this weekend that you wouldn't believe. We said, so all right, let's have it. Troy said that he got up there and settled in, but Minor Bill wouldn't hardly talk to him for the first day he was there. He spent the night, and this would have probably been on a Sunday or a Monday. He said that they'd just finished dinner and were going to bed when the dog started growling. Troy said, This was the first time I'd ever heard that dog make a sound at night when we're all locked up there. With that growling and all, Minor Bill just went into a rage. He went from one side of the cabin to the other and kept looking out the window. Troy said it was pitch black and snowing with the clouds on the ground. He didn't think there was anything out there. He thought probably a bear came down or something. Well, 
The dog finally settled down. Troy got a hold of Minor Bill and sat him down and asked, What is going on up here? Minor Bill said, I don't know what is going on up here, but whatever it is has been haunting me for the last six years. Come here and I'll show you. He grabbed his old oil lantern and went out into the snow. Around the cabin, there were some real big Engelmann spruce trees, probably stood 80, 90 feet tall. There were no limbs until you got up to 30 feet. Minor Bill shone the light up on these trees. Troy said, I don't know what he was looking at on the bark of those trees. Minor Bill said to Troy, little higher, little higher. Troy kept looking up and finally he could see some marks on the trees. He said, yeah, there's some marks on the trees up there. A bear probably climbed up there. Minor Bill said, no, no, that isn't a bear. You wait. You wait until morning. We'll come out in the daylight and I'll show you what it is. Well, they got back in the cabin and almost settled in when the dog started growling again. This time he was lunging against his chain in the middle of the floor. Troy got up and looked up the canyon toward Iceberg Lake where that gorge comes down. He said, there was a blue light kind of shining. It must have been a reflection of something coming off of something else. This blue haze kept shifting down, and as it got closer, the dog growled more. Pretty soon, this light came right into the cabin area. I've never seen anything like it before. It was like a mist in the clouds. It settled into a tree out there, just like it was hanging onto the tree or surrounding it. Minor Bill was just completely erratic. He was going from room to room, and the dog was making such a fuss and whatnot. All of a sudden, the light was gone, and the dog settled right down on the floor. Minor Bill just went to bed and never said another word. I stayed up the rest of the night looking out the window. Dawn came, and we went outside. There was probably four or five inches of fresh snow on the ground, on top of the foot and a half to two feet that was already there. There was not one animal track in that whole area, not even a rabbit track. He said he looked up at this tree that this blue haze had evidently been around. There was a three-toed claw mark about 20 feet up on the tree. He said he got to looking around, and every tree but one around that whole place had a three-toed mark on it. Troy said there was no explanation that he knew of. He walked over to the tree where there were bark peelings on the ground, right in the fresh snow. There wasn't a track up to it. He said, there surely must be a bear that flies up there. I can't explain it, but I'm going to get out of here. The day after that, when the weather broke, Troy told Minor Bill, In two weeks, I'm going to come back up here and I'm going to get you out of here. Minor Bill said, Well, whatever. So that's the story Troy related to us. Curiosity got the best of us by then. Two days later, there was a bright, beautiful, sunny day, and we saddled up some horses and rode up there. We plunged our way up through the snow and got up there, and sure enough, on those trees were the marks. Some of them looked like they were six or seven years old. We thought that maybe old Minor Bill had been crawling up the tree with a knife and carving these marks in it, but they really didn't look that way. It looked like an animal had put the marks in the trees. As a matter of fact, those marks are still visible up there in those trees. Anyway, when we went up there, we saw that right in front of the main door of the cabin, there was one tree that didn't have a mark on it. Troy tried several more times without success to convince Minor Bill to move away from his cabin on Old Fall River Road. It wasn't until early February that Troy seemed to make any headway. Troy rolled in late one Friday evening. He said, I'll go up and pack everything that Minor Bill has and leave it packed. In the spring, when you get up there with horses, you bring it out, but I'm going to bring Bill out with me. So he left early Saturday morning and said, I'll be out probably tomorrow, but if the weather closes in, we'll be out whenever it breaks. Unfortunately, the weather did close in. By late Tuesday evening, we were starting to wonder what had happened to Troy and Minor Bill. I had gone back to school, and I drove back every night from Fort Collins just to see if Troy had come back. I got back up there about 8.30 that night, and Troy hadn't come out. I decided to stay over, and Wednesday morning we were going to go up and find them. We all went to bed that night, and it must have been about 1.30 or 2 o'clock in the morning when the clouds lifted a little bit, and the wind started blowing. It was drifting the snow pretty badly. The wind probably woke me up. I was laying there at probably 1.30 in the morning when I heard somebody banging on the front door of the lodge. I was up on the second floor, so the owner of the lodge got there before I did. He opened the door, and there stood Troy. Troy said, We've got to get to town. We've got to get Minor Bill to town. We said, Fine, we've got the old Ford truck chained up, and I think we can make it into town. We asked what happened. Troy said, His head is caved in. 
With that, we gathered up a lot of tarps and quilts. Troy had brought Miner Bill out by lashing three skis together and tying Bill to them. Well, we just picked up Miner Bill, skis and all, and loaded him in the back of the old truck. Old Doc Mall was practicing then. We got him out of bed and he met us down at the clinic. After looking at Miner Bill, Doc Mall said, There isn't much I can do for him here. He told us to get him to Greeley about as quick as we could. If we did, there might be a chance to save the old man. We headed right off to Greeley and arrived at the hospital an hour and a half later. They took him right in. Troy told us to go back up and he would stay down there until Bill was out of danger. Late Wednesday evening, Troy came back up. We asked him what had happened. He said, you're not going to believe this story. I had him convinced to leave when the clouds came in. We were puttering around the kitchen, packing up his utensils and personal belongings. All of a sudden, the dog started growling and I looked out of the window. There was that blue light again. It just seemed to hover around. One time, it went clear up to the needles of Ypsilon Mountain. It sat up there for an hour. All of a sudden, it came back down and lit in this one tree that didn't have the claw marks in it. Miner Bill lost his mind. He grabbed his old rusty gun from above the door. As he opened the door, the Doberman lunged and broke his chain and ran out. The dog leaped up the tree, and just as soon as he jumped, he was laying in the doorway. The dog's throat was cut. With that, Miner Bill ran out and started shooting that old lever action gun up in the tree. Soon as he got under the tree, a branch must have broken and hit him in the head. When Bill hit the ground, it was dark out there, no blue mist or anything. I assume that one of his shells hit an old limb and weakened it. Miner Bill lived, but his mind was not quite right from that day on. They put him down in the state home. Every once in a while, he'd slip away from them, and three or four days later, they'd go pick him up at his old cabin. At that time, our district ranger was named Lauren Lane. He and I did a lot of plowing around up there. We took casts of these supposed claw marks. We took pictures, but nothing ever came of it. We thought Minor Bill was just an old man who got hit on the head with a tree branch. About three years went by, and a group from the Fort Collins Ski Club came up. They were going to Lawn Lake on an overnight. They skied up there on a beautiful moonlit night. They were all full of energy, and they decided to ski up to Crystal before going to bed. So about 18 of them hiked the trail up to Crystal Lake. One by one, they came back down. It was so light that you could see everyone on the hill. Everybody came down, but the last person decided to go up to Rowe Glacier, which was probably 150 yards. They could see him walking up there for most of the way, but then he disappeared around the bend for just a minute. Just then, a blue haze rose up from Crystal Lake. They said they could see him, and then they couldn't. They sat there, and waited, and waited, but he didn't come down. They waited an hour. Three of the party decided to go up there. They could see where they had come down. They could see where their companion had telemarked up the hill and turned. But that was it. His tracks just stopped right there. They made big circles around and couldn't find a trace of him. They sent two boys down. These boys arrived at the lodge about 4.30 in the morning. We called Lauren Lane, and he organized a search party. In those days, there were probably 10 personnel in Rocky Mountain National Park in the winter. We headed up about 8.30 that morning and got up there about noon. We found the tracks, but no trace of the skier. Nothing. Nothing. Off to the right, about 10 feet from his track, were these three tracks coming down the mountain. We all figured when the snow melted off in the spring, somebody would stumble across the body. The body was never found. Four years later, another group of hikers had paused when one in their group experienced some mountain sickness. The clouds, tinged blue, settled down over the group, and when they lifted, the ailing hiker had vanished. The only thing left where he had been sitting were three claw marks. Another year passed, and a large group of folks got stuck in Grand Lake when a storm hit. The rangers formed a convoy to lead everyone back down safely. The last car, a family of five, pulled over because one of the little boys felt sick. A ranger noticed a blue mist by the car and went over to check on them. Apparently, The boy felt better, and the family drove away. Standing in the spot where the car had been stopped, the ranger looked down to see a three-toed claw mark. Sometime after that, two hikers went in. Only one came out. Three months later, travelers noticed a blue mist hanging over the mountain. They mentioned it to their waitress when they stopped for lunch, who called the sheriff. Right where the blue mist had been seen, the sheriff found the body of the second hiker. 
another group of hikers tried to scale Mount Lady Washington. All of them ascended as far as they could and then descended again. All but one. The other hikers notified the Park Service and rangers began the search. They found her on a hillside by Grand Lake. Her bright orange coat made her stand out. When they got to her, she was surrounded by a circle of the now infamous three-toed tracks. All she could remember was seeing a blue mist settle around her. So ends the legend. Plenty have witnessed the blue mist, and those who haven't have seen the evidence left behind. In a national park, you expect someone to get lost every so often. But now, when the blue mist is spotted, park rangers and townspeople alike begin suiting up for a search party. Those were our stories for today. I hope you enjoyed them. Thank you for listening to another episode of Virtual Campfire Stories, and I hope you'll come back again. Remember, all of the stories for this program will be available in the Virtual Campfire Stories for Grown Ups playlist on our YouTube channel. If you're interested in reading more from Campfire Stories, Tales from America's National Parks, contact the library. Have a great week, and I'll talk to you again next Monday. Bye!